Thanks for joining me on my ride. That was a paper from Christian Kaiser's lab at the NIN in Amsterdam. Groetje, groetjes Nederland. It's is heel lang geleden dat ik heb Nederlands gepraten. En ik wel, uh, ik mis Nederland hoor. Ik hoop dat jullie uh, die coronavirus echt in de hand hebben. Uh, het klinkt niet goed, maar in ieder geval groetjes aan de Kaiser lab in Amsterdam. Uh, this is a paper where they look at uh, how harm or perceived harm in a conspecific can affect behavior and affect and how reward can affect that behavior as well. They have a really clever task where they allow one animal to reward itself with food by pressing a lever and then punish one of those levers by shocking a conspecific in the cage next door. And they see that animals, at least a certain percentage of these rats, will switch their lever preference to avoid shocking their friend in the compartment next door. Interestingly enough, if they play with the reward, so they give them more nuggets for each lever press, then at a certain moment that rat doesn't care anymore if his friend is getting shocked. I find this a really interesting paper that I referenced back to Peggy Mason's paper from 2012, which I also think falls nicely into this category and fits together in terms of thinking about what's happening here and what these animals are actually doing. I think empathy in rats is a really neat finding because, again, rats are very social and very intelligent. It's not very uh, surprising, but on the other hand, not very many people are doing research like this, and I find this a really exciting avenue. Um, you can imagine a scenario where this kind of social behavior could then be changed um, in certain uh, mouse models or rat models of autism. Um, it could be changed in certain models of depression, and so using this task as kind of a readout of the social awareness of a rat may be a really cool uh, way to go forward. So I'm interested to see what this lab produces in the future. Um, if you liked it, like and subscribe. The ride's coming afterward. It's a pretty good ride, pretty succinct. Um, and I cover Peggy's paper and uh, the Kaiser Lab paper, so it's a nice, uh, I think it's a nice follow up. If you liked it, like and subscribe. We'll see you next week on JC and Mike. Good evening, Pittsburgh and Universe. This is JC on a bike. My name is JC and this is Journal Club on a bike. We're going to talk about empathy in rats tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Empathy. Do you feel for others around you? Do you sense pain? Do you sense suffering? And maybe more importantly, do you care if it ends or not? So inspiring me to do this Journal Club are two papers. One which came out quite a few years ago in the December of 2011 from Peggy Mason's lab at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I was a technician at the University of Chicago and so I at least knew Peggy Mason's research and I knew a couple grad students in her lab and I can tell a very funny anecdotal story about pain research in the Raffae nucleus, which her lab used to do back in the day. She had a grad student who did rectal distension as a model for pain, so basically what that is, you put a balloon in the rectum of a rat, and by inflating this balloon you get a pain signal in the, in the Raffae nucleus. And I think they do this on an anesthesia and stuff, it's not a nasty terrible torturing animal thing. It's just that when you rectally distend, you can get a reliable pain signal. And so it's a, it's a model for pain processing in the rapid nucleus. He went to SFN with a poster detailing pain signals in the rapid nucleus resulting from rectal distension and he was single at the time. He didn't marry this girl. I don't even think he got a date with her. But it was just funny because this was the second or third SFN that I went to. And so, you know, I was still, I still am like a kid in a candy store when I go to SFN. And so I went to his, his poster and I just found it incredibly hilarious. 
that an incredibly attractive, very tall, beautiful woman had a poster right next to his god dang poster that was also doing rectal distension in rats. And I kind of think that he thought that he kind of had one of those topics that, you know, limited his socialization potential simply because he never really wanted to explain what he did. And then here's this girl. I don't even think we talked to her or anything, but it was still pretty of a funny coincidence. So that's Peggy Mason's lab. And Peggy Mason's Peggy Mason's lab is responsible for this empathy paper that was in science in 2011, December 2011, or maybe first week of 2012. And what they did was they exposed rats to a series of situations wherein they were in an open field and then there might be a cage, a little restrainer cage, plastic restrainer cage in there. Or there might be another rat on the other side of a barrier and a cage there too. Or inside of this little restraining cage there was a rat that was restrained and couldn't turn around. And if the rats were taught to be able to open that cage, then interestingly enough through a bunch of different control experiments, Dr. Mason's lab was able to show that the rats, not for food and not for other reasons, seemed to be releasing rats from restraint. And they tended to do it much more than random. It was slightly more females than males. But it was a really neat result and such a wonderfully cool experiment. I think in that experiment also there's another paper maybe or another set of data which details the vocalizations of the animals that are restrained, yada yada yada. But it's really cool because the animals open the cage less randomly when there is an animal restrained in it than if there's chocolate or other things encouraging them to open the cage for other reasons. It's a really cool paper. If you haven't seen it, it's a real simple result. But I think it's a really neat run. And so the paper that I'm covering today, the recent paper, I feel like kind of follows up on this. And what they do in this paper, this is from Christian, Christian Kaiser's lab in Amsterdam at the NIN. There's a couple, three different neuroscience institutes in Amsterdam. The NIN is one of them. And the NIN is sort of connected with uh, the Amsterdam University Medical Center. And then separate from that you have the FU in Amsterdam, the Frey Universiteit. So can, uh, that's also in Netherlands, a Dutch research hub. So this is from the NIN. And they've come up with a pretty I mean, it's more elaborate than what Peggy Mason's lab did, where they are able to train rats in a room where they push a lever for food. And so if you look at figure 1F, where this is going to start for me, you can see how they train the animals. In the first column, the training is just and it's a cartoon of the training. The first cartoon you can see, it doesn't matter which lever they press, pre they press, they get three nuggets. I'll call them nuggets. I think they're sucrose pellets. And then on the second and third training days, they don't get three, they get one. And then on the fourth and fifth days, they get, they're still getting nuggets on, on both levers, but now one lever is harder to press than the other one. So they're kind of prepping them for all of the contingencies that they're going to put them through during the training. And in figure one on the top, you can see the actual setup. There is an actor compartment, the actor being the mouse that makes, decides whether to push the left lever or the, lever or the right lever, which again, during training, it doesn't matter. They get rewarded for both. And 
Then what they do, interestingly, extremely interestingly, they take the animal and they put him in the victim compartment and they shock him four times. So now the animal is afraid of that side of the box and associates that side of the box with pain. And now they put the animal back into the actor compartment and they let him push the levers again to see which lever he prefers. And in general, this behavior becomes stereotyped. That's just something to understand about how mice do this. They don't push both sides. Once they decide or develop a preference, if both levers are rewarded equally, they will eventually start pressing a left or the right just because they get into a little bit of a habit. It doesn't mean that they don't understand that both sides are rewarded. They just stop randomizing it and they start using one or the other. And that's the preferred lever after the exposure training part. So, so they stereotype their behavior. So once they've seen the other animal get shocked, they put them back in the actor compartment and they just let them run the task again until they have stereotyped to either left or right. That's the preferred direction. And then they do the cool trick. They expose the animal four times or three times to the situation where if they push their preferred lever, the animal will get a, a pellet, but they will also see the victim get a foot shock. And so there will be vocalizations and uh, noises and, and, and uh, the associated reaction so that the animal is aware that the other animal is getting foot shocked. And so interestingly enough, if you watch the successive trials of this task, you will see that the animals stop choosing their preferred lever and start going to the other lever, even though they have already sort of stereotyped themselves to picking left, they start picking the right one after they see the animal get shocked. And this is the big result, I think, and this is really cool. So the first two figures then show the behavior, but they show the behavior uh, from the perspective of all animals and all variables, and not variables, but like all treatment conditions in the sense of they didn't separate anything out. And so in figure two, the reason why that matters is because in figure two, they show you that there's a great amount of individual variation and very specifically, interestingly enough, there are rats which switch their preference to the lever immediately upon this training trial. And then there are animals that don't ever switch. So essentially you can be, have a propensity to show propensity to show empathy or you can have a propensity not to show empathy and so in the first part of figure two you can see the green filled circles are the animals that change their switching index it's like the ratio of you know bad choice to good choice they make a very obvious change statistically that the other animals do not and so if we just concentrate on the switching animals we see a couple really neat results. And that is shown in figure three again. So figure three is the individual variation. Figure two, I believe, is the one that just shows the whole group response to the training of... So figure two shows the cumulative data in A, and then in B it separates that cumulative data from male and female. And then in three they show the individual variation. In A they show you the percentage of animals and the number of animals that really make an awesomely obvious choice to change their behavior and there's a bunch of animals that don't really change their behavior and so in this figure then they're going to split split the switchers thank you split the switchers and the non-switchers up so that we can look at the effects in those groups separately And what we see in those groups is very, very different. And the behavior in particular that I really enjoy is their time at the feed port. 
And if you look carefully in figure three, I'm not sure which number and letter it is anymore. Come on. Seriously? God dang it. You can pass. You don't have to freaking stop. Freaking ride. Get out of my way if you don't know how to ride a bike. It hurts me. Figure 3D is the money figure. Three D is the money figure where they actually show the cool effect that I think is cool anyway. What happens is they look at feed port dwell time. And really cool, if you were a switcher and you press the lever that shocked your contingent rat, how would you show that that bothered you? What would your behavior be like? Well, he might be prone to run away from the action, to not dwell in the place where the food was. Just get it and get out of there. And that's what's neat. The switchers, when they do shock their cohort, it's almost like they feel bad about it. And they don't dwell in the feed hole to wait and see if more to wait and see if more pellets come out. They don't wait. They go get it and they run. And that figure, that's in figure 3D. And I think it's an excellent figure and an excellent result, which jives really well with their interpretation of the behavior of the animal. I really like it a lot. It's really neat. So then, in figure four, what they're going to do is put Musimol in the anterior cingulate cortex, which they think has something to do with this behavior, and show that the animals which are switchers, their behavior can be affected. And they don't have enough data in this figure, if I read it right, to separate the switchers out and make a you know, make a mean and standard deviation of switchers versus non-switchers. But what they do show you in that cumulative graph is that the effect on the population is to reduce this, what appears to be some sensitivity to harming others. I think it's a really neat paper. And I think it goes along really well with Peggy Mason's result from 2012 and I'd like to see more papers like this where conspecifics are used as a cue um, to probe empathy or to probe social behavior. What an interesting possible possible experimental paradigm to use with I don't know, autistic mouse models, for example. What a great paper, though, really cool. <laughs>